All right. Re-upping at the light Z connection. Chapter three. Positioning. While G. Stanley Hall had been once first American student, his compatriot, James McKean Cattell, had the distinction of being once first assistant and later the most effective publicist and promoter of the revised psychology. Cattell was born in 1860 in Pennsylvania and received his bachelor's degree from Lafayette College. His father was president in 1880. He then spent a short period of time in Germany where he met one and saw his laboratory. Returning to Germany in 1883, Cattell went to Leipzig and told Wundt that he was going to be his assistant. Wundt acceded and Cattell spent the next three years experimenting in Wundt's lab, receiving his PhD from him in 1886. Cattell's primary interest lay in mental testing and individual differences in ability. One series of experiments Cattell performed while at Leipzig examined the matter in which a person sees the words he is reading. Testing adults who knew how to read, Cattell found they could recognize words without having to sound out the letters. From this, he reasoned that words are not read by compounding the letters, but are perceived as total word pictures. He determined that little is gained by teaching the child his sounds and letters as the first step to being able to read, since they can recognize words very rapidly. The way to teach children how to read would be to show them words and tell them what the words were. This breakthrough of Cattell's led to the adoption of a sight reading method in many schools and school systems throughout the United States. Its failure to produce an expected increase in literacy is hardly attributed to Cattell's perception of findings which have been validated and enlarged upon in our time with superb results by Glenn Dolman of the Institute of the Achievement of Human Potential. Rather, Cattell's results were subsequently applied by teachers trained in the new psychology who managed to convert even this otherwise brilliant observation into a national crisis. I have a child and um, I remember when he was in elementary school, a long time ago at this point, and I was surprised to find out that he was being taught sight words and not how to pronounce words. Because for me, that's how you learn how to read. You learn sounds and you put together sounds and you learn vowels and you put together the sounds and vowels and everything else. And that's how you learn how to read. And through that process, as you get older, when your mind sees a word that you've never seen before, even if you haven't seen it, your mind has processed the sounds of the word and it comes out of your mouth before you've ever seen it. Or if you've never seen it before, you, you know that word because your mind has put it together. And then there's also the aspect of when you have said a word many times before, your mind has put together, in your mind it's put together what that word looks like. And so then that word comes out of your mouth and without you ever have seen, seen it before. But this man Cattell said that your mind perceived words as a total cluster of pictures total word pictures, he called them, which is okay if you have learned how to read and you know how to pronounce words. I don't disagree with total word pictures if you've been through the process of learning from kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, right on up through the scale of the entire course of school. You'll know words that you've never seen before and can pronounce them but that's because you know how to pronounce words. They don't just come to you automatically because all of a sudden you've seen a word and away you go. And it's just automatic. That would really be amazing if people just knew words automatically from the first time that they were seen. But this man Cattell said that pretty much if you can't do that, your ability to do so isn't in you. And it's not going to become in you. It's not just going to pop up out of nowhere. 
you would have to have this born into you, just like the whole organic kingdom did. He said that the, the this ability came from the entire organic kingdom. So he's looking at the world of flowers even and saying, hey, that's your potential. Your potential isn't any higher than what the organic kingdom is because these things are born in you. Your ability is born in you and there's nothing you can do to change. But like I've said before, Christ said that people have the ability to change and people also have the ability to learn. But the beginning of knowledge starts with God. And that's something that everybody should continue to remember that your ability can be changed, but you have to put forth the effort to change and learn. And we also have to teach our children because these people aren't going to teach your children anything. All right. They're going to dumb our children down and you'll be stuck there because they think that's the tip of your potential. It's the top of the iceberg is what you're born with. So another reason I was really amazed at this is that for many years, I don't even know how long Sesame Street was on television or even, or even if it's still on television. But I bring up Sesame Street to say this. What I remember is on Sesame Street, they were always sounding out words. They went through vowels all the time and consonants and all types of things and compounding letters, you know, two word sounds or three letter sounds, whether it was sh or at or ack as an A-C-K or mm or at as an A-T. They were always sounding out words on Sesame Street only for us to go into sight words. You know, I never saw sight words on Sesame Street. Somebody determined a long time ago that the best way to learn was to learn how to compound sounds, which is something that my man over here could tell was against. He said he reasoned that words are not read by compounding the letters but are perceived as total word pictures. So we're not compounding. We're not putting things together. You should just know what the word is automatically the first time it's shown to you, which is just garbage. If that was the truth, everybody would know words that were put in front of them. But nobody learns like that. And that's why this stuff is just so ridiculous. And if your child is having problems at school, I recommend that you go back to the old school method. Even though in school, they're not going to recommend the old school method, you'll consistently have to be involved in your child's schoolwork to ensure that they know different ways of how to tackle a problem. Yes, yeah, sure, they'll know how to compound letters, but in school, they're going to have to do things how school wants them to do, or the school is going to look at them as being ignorant or dyslexic or whatever the hell term they have to call children who don't want to learn this crap that they're teaching our kids nowadays. But hey, what do I know? I'm not a scholar, you know, but I am very analytical. Returning to the United States, Cattell lectured at Byron Moir and at the University of Pennsylvania for a year. In 1887, the same year in which Hall published his aspects of German culture, he left the country again to lecture at Cambridge where he met and was deeply impressed by Charles Darwin's cousin, the English psychologist, Francis Galton. Galton's theories held that a man's natural abilities are derived by inheritance under exactly the same limitations as are the form and physical features of the whole organic world. Cattell quickly absorbed Galton's approach to eugenics, selective breeding, and the measurement of intelligence. Cattell was later to become the American leader and psychological testing, and in 1894 would administer the first battery of psychological tests ever to a large group of people testing the freshmen and senior classes at Columbia University. Again, this theory that you are no better than the whole organic kingdom, which can't learn, all right? The, the, the organic kingdom isn't learning new things without being taught them, but 
you know, again, I'm sure they're talking about things like plants and grass and stuff like that. Stuff that can't learn anything. So, you know, we keep getting compared to these things that are unable to learn. Continuing the reading. Returning from Cambridge, Cattell became professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, the first professor of the revised subject anywhere in the world. Once title was in philosophy. At Pennsylvania, he established one of the first psychological laboratories in the country, patterning it after once Leipzig model. Leaving Pennsylvania in 1891, Cattell joined the faculty of Columbia University as professor of psychology and head of Columbia's new psychology department, a critical position for the Union of Psychology and Education. At Columbia, Cattell shown as an organizer and publicist. To promote the new science of experimental psychology, Cattell created publications which would carry the new subject to educators and scientists across the country. First, he began a new journal in 1894 called the Psychological Review. Then he purchased from Alexander Graham Bell the weekly publication Science, which later became the official journal of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In 1900, he began popular Science Monthly, continued to publish it after 1915 as Scientific Monthly. That same year, he began yet another publication, The Weekly School and Society. He also began a series of well-known reference works, American Men of Science, Leaders in Education, and the Directory of American Scholars. With publications such as these, he positioned the revived psychology within the mainstream of American thinking, the proponents of this new field taking their places alongside our leading scientists, educators, and scholars in the pages of these reference books. So, he created seven different publications in a short period of time for his whack revised psychology to flood the American mainstream of education, scholars, universities, schools, whoever wanted to read about psychology or the revised psychology was reading Cattell's material. Amazing. During the 25 years at Columbia, Cattell supervised 344 successful doctoral candidates in psychology. Let's say in 25 years, there weren't even 50 states yet. In 1895, he was elected president of the American Psychological Association. And in, 18, and in 1900, he became the first psych psychologist elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Although he never wrote a textbook and was the author of only a few papers in this field, he publicized experimental psychology broadly, organized his colleagues, and promoted their accomplishments, enabling them to consolidate their positions in the departments of philosophy and later psychology at major universities across the country. They were pretty much unstoppable. You know, when you, when you consolidate your power, you're going to steamroll everybody else. A few of those colleagues deserve passing mention here as they directly influenced the fusion of experimental psychology and American education. James Mark Baldwin, who studied with Wundt, became a professor of psychology at Princeton in 1893, Princeton's Ivy League. And in 1903, he joined the psychology department at John Hopkins University. Baldwin was to become one of the leaders of American experimental psychology and editor of Cattell's Psychological Review. Andrew C. Armstrong, professor of psychology at Wesleyan University and building up Wesleyan's faculty in the revised subject, hired in 1896 his own former student, the ardent young experimentalist, Charles Judd, fresh from Germany with a Leipzig doctorate from one. Judd later left Wesleyan to become successively instructor in psychology at New York University School of Pedagogy, professor of psychology and pedagogy at the University of Cincinnati, director of the psychological laboratory and psychological instructor 
at jail, Ivy League. You know, people treat Ivy League like it's all that special. But perhaps Ivy League is where you go to get brainwashed. And finally, in 1909, director of the School of Education at the University of Chicago, James Earl Russell, a student of once who received his doctorate from Leipzig in 1894, came to Columbia University in October 1897, five years after the New York College for the Training of Teachers had received its permanent charter as Columbia's Teachers College. So the teachers who kind of want to say they graduated as a part of Columbia would go to the New York College for the Training of Teachers because it was known as Columbia's Teachers College, right? So you want to say, hey, I want, a, I want a degree from Columbia in teaching. You would go to the New York College because they were under the umbrella of Columbia. Again, Columbia is another school where you can go to get brainwashed all you want. If you want to get brainwashed, take your butt to Columbia and see what happens. Russell had already occupied positions of administrative responsibility, having been, while at Leipzig, an official European agent for the Federal Bureau of Education, then located in the Department of the Interior, appointed head of the Department of Psychology and General Method, Russell directed the Central Department at Teachers College. That same year, Russell became Dean of the college. He would run it for the next 30 years building the largest institution in the world for the training of teachers, right? So the teachers who go out now into America have been taught once experimental style of psychology. And when they teach your children, your children will be dumbed down. Thus in, 19, thus in 1897, the stage was about to be set for the propagation of once laboratory psychology throughout the American throughout American education. So that's chapter three. We'll be moving on to chapter four.